Okay, we are recording. This is the Kabbalah webinar for Lagba Omer uh, of the year 5756 in the Hebrew calendar, 577, uh, 5, 5767, 7, in the Hebrew calendar, which is uh, 2016 in the English calendar. Um, what is Lagba Omer? What is it all about? So, Lagba Omer is the day of the passing of Rabbi Shimon. Yes, it is recording. It is the passing of the famous uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That was his name, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, a second century sage who, um, whose primary focus was Kabbalah, the inner dimension of the Torah, and we'll explain a little bit more about what that means shortly. Now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, was um, very well respected in his generation, but there were people that did not recognize the greatness of Rabbi Shimon. He was a student of the famous Rabbi Akiva, and once, on one occasion, when Rabbi Akiva was sitting his students down around the table in order to instruct them, uh, in order to instruct them, so uh, Rabbi Shimon uh, was placed not at the front of the table, and his face showed a sort of uh, dissatisfaction. Rabbi Akiva whispered to him, only you and I know that the, the level that you're on. So Rabbi Shimon, therefore, was... Um, someone who remained to a very large extent hidden, and this is perhaps the reason that the Zohar remained hidden for many, many years. The Zohar is, you might want to say, the Bible of Kabbalah. In other words, it's the book which, on which all of the other teachings of Kabbalah are based. There were some books that preceded uh, the Zohar, like Sefer Yitzhir and Sefer Bahir and various others. But um, the most important um, work upon which everything else is predicated is essentially the Zohar, which was hidden and uh, later came to light again in the 1300s. Now, what I'm, going to, uh, what I'm going to do now is read a little bit from the day of the passing of Rabbi Shimon, which was recorded by his students, and it is written in the Zohar, it's my own uh, English translation of it, just to give you a taste of what actually went on on that day that he passed away, on the day that he passed away. So, this is a section from what is called the Idra Zuta, I-D-R-A-Z-U-T-A, -A, the Idra Zuta. And the Idra Zuta is um, at the end of the third book of the Zohar in the parsha called Ha'azinu, the Idra Zuta. Idra Zuta means a small chamber. There's the Idra Rabbah and Idra Zuta. The Idra Rabbah was a larger gathering and the Idra Zuta was a smaller gathering. And we'll soon explain why. So we have learned. I'm reading now from the Idra Zuta, my translation. On the day that Rabbi Shimon passed away from this world, he was organizing his final teachings and he commanded his household. In other words, he told his family that he would no longer be alive uh, shortly and um, he commanded his household, he told them what he, his last will and testament, so to speak. And they, of course, sent out the word to all the students, and the students then gathered. The Hebraia, the fellowship of his colleagues and disciples, gathered together at his house, Rabbi Laza, his son, that was the son of Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Abba, and the other members of the Hebraia sat before him, so that the house was full. Rabbi Shimon, who was in a deeply meditative state, looked up and saw that the house was full of people. He wept and he said, on a previous occasion, when I was gravely ill, only Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, his brother-in-law, sat with me. While I was choosing my place, by which he means while he was choosing his place in the Garden of Eden, and I'll tell you a short story about that shortly, while I was choosing my place in the Garden of Eden in Paradise, they extended my life until this time. In other words, he was preparing to die on a previous occasion and his life had been extended until this time, until this moment. From the moment I returned from the Garden of Eden from Paradise, fire surrounded me and it never ceased since then. 
so that no one could approach without permission. Now I see that the fire has terminated and the house is filled up with disciples and with colleagues and so on and so forth. Now, just to digress for a second, why was Rabbi Shimon upset about this? Why was the fact that uh, people were coming in uh, unbidden and uninvited, so to speak, why did it upset him so much? It had nothing to do with the fact that people were coming to visit him as such, as we'll see soon, but because he thought that he would not have the power to be able to give over the teachings that he wanted to give on his final day. He didn't think that he had the uh, blessings and the divine providence and the power to be able to transmit the deepest, deepest, deepest secrets of the Torah that he was intending to transmit on this day. And that's why he was upset. So um, the house filled up with disciples. Now, I said I would mention a short story. There's a brief story about the, one of the disciples of Rabbi Shimon, whose name was Rabbi, Rabbi Abba was the one that actually wrote down all of these teachings. And uh, the story is told that Rabbi Abba, when, uh, when he was about to pass away, they told him he wanted to know, well, where is it that I'm going? Am I going up or am I going down? Am I going to the Garden of Eden, Paradise, or the other place? And uh, they said, no, you're going to the Garden of Eden, to Paradise. And so he said, I'm not so sure I want to go there. Let me have a look at it first. So they took him up, and this is all obviously in graphic imagery. It's not meant to... Um, suggest that it is actually like that, but they took him up on the wall surrounding the barrier surrounding the Garden of Eden. And they said, he said, so where is the place that I'm going to be? And they showed him that place from, uh, from where he was uh, perched on the wall, so to speak. And he quickly jumped into the Garden of Eden and uh, he was in. And uh, a hue and cry ensued uh, in the heavenly court. How can he didn't die? How can he go into the Garden of Eden? How can he go into the Garden of Eden alive? And there was a whole court case and so on and so forth. And uh, the verdict eventually was that Rabbi Abba can go in alive. He does not have to come out again. The whole point being that some people are on such a lofty level that they can go straight into the concept of divine bliss, which is what uh, the Garden of Eden represents, the Garden of Eden represents, that they don't need to go through barriers, they don't need to go through the experience of death, which Mrs. Tukanik will be talking about. Uh, Mrs. Tukanik will uh, be coming on third, and she'll be talking about that. Rabbi Pinson was also going to talk about that, but uh, the substitute, uh, Rabbi Silverberg will be talking about that, Silverstein rather, will be talking about something else. Okay, in any event, let's continue now with the, Idra, uh, with the Idra Zuta. While they were sitting, the guests were sitting around, Rabbi Shimon opened his eyes and saw what he saw, and the house became engulfed in flames. Everyone fled, and only Rabbi Al-Azhar, that was his son, and Rabbi Abba, his chief disciple who wrote things down, remained. The other members of the Chavraya sat down outside. Rabbi Shimon said to Rabbi Lazahi, Rabbi Lazahi's son, go outside and see if Rabbi Yitzchak is here. Rabbi Yitzchak was one of the disciples. I made him a promise that he would come with me on the day of my passing. Tell him to arrange his affairs at home and then come and sit with me. In other words, he won't be going home again. How fortunate is his lot and he's coming with me. Rabbi Shimon arose and then sat down again, smiling and joyful. Notice he wasn't in anguish, he knew that he was going to pass away, but he wasn't in a state of anguish or, or, or sadness and so on. Then he asked, where are the members of the Hevraya, his holy brotherhood, the, the, the students, the disciples? Rabbi went and ushered them in, and they sat down before Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon raised his hands and prayed his prayers, and he was joyful. He said, those who were with me in the Idra Rabbah, in the greater chamber, where he revealed many, many lofty secrets, are invited here. Now, when he was inviting the people from the Idra Rabbah, most of the students who were in the Idra Rabbah were there, except three of them who had passed away during that time, during the Idra Rabbah, during that previous revelation. It was so great that they couldn't contain and they passed away. He was calling their souls to come and participate in the current revelation that was just about to happen. So um, the others went out again, leaving Rabbi Loza, Rabbi, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yosef, and Rabbi, Chir, and Rabbi, Rabbi Chir. At that moment, Rabbi Yitzhak entered, and Rabbi Shimon says to him, Come, sit down. How pleasant is your lot? How good is your portion? Many secrets will be revealed to you today. 
And Rabbi Abba went to sit behind Rabbi Shimon, and um, he then says the following, Rabbi Shimon, the Rashbi, the uh, star of the show, so to speak, the person whose Hilula we celebrate or we commemorate, the passing of, who, of whom we commemorate on this day, the day of Lag Ba'omet, this is the day of his passing. He says as follows, Now is an auspicious time. I wish to ascend to the world to come, the world of the future. In other words, the world that is always becoming. It's never fixed. It's never past. It's always becoming because it's an infinite world. I wish to ascend to that world without shame. Those holy matters that have not been revealed until now, I wish to reveal in the presence of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. So that no one can say that I left this world lacking. Until this moment they were hidden in my heart, so that I could ascend with them to the world to come. But now I will present him to you. Rabbi Abel will write, my son Rabbi Elazar will review, he will teach what Rabbi Abba has written out loud, and the other members of the Chavraya will whisper them in their hearts, they'll think over what was uh, going on. <clears throat> Rabbi Abba stood up from behind Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Loza was still before his father, but Rabbi Shimon said, stand up my son, someone else will sit in that spot, and another soul comes from the Garden of Eden. That is the introduction to this whole section called the Idrarabba. Ah, sorry, the Idrizuta. Now, what exactly was going on over here? What was it that Rabbi Shimon was about to reveal? What was the secret, the deepest secret of the Kabbalah that he was about to reveal on this day? Well, he starts to talk about the inner dimensions of the level of Keter. Now everybody knows in the uh, Sfirot, in the uh, setup of the Sfirot, the highest of the Sfirot is a Sfira called Keter. Um, anyone who needs a diagram of this, you can go to my website and you can download from there. Um, you will see um, the, uh, the diagram of the Sfirot. The inner dimension of Keter, in Keter itself there are actually uh, several levels. The most important levels are called Arich Anpin and Atik Yomin. Arich Anpin and Atik Yomin. The inner dimension of Atik Yomin, Atik Yomin literally means the Ancient of Days, and Arich Anpin means, literally speaking, long faces, but what it means is length, basically infinite length, infinite uh, extension, and Atik Yomin means ancient, in other words, it comes from the highest, the very, very highest source. Well, what Rabbi Shimon does at this particular time is he starts to expound on the dimensions, the inner dimensions, the inner structure, so to speak, of Atik Yomin, of this very, very exalted and lofty level called Atik Yomin. Now, even though uh, the idea of um, Atik Yomin is extremely lofty and something that um, needs a tremendous, tremendous amount of study to really be able to understand, there are certain areas and certain things that we can understand from them, uh, from the teachings that were, were revealed in the Idra Rabbah. But the most important thing that we have to understand is the following. Rabbi Shimon begins to talk about things that had never been revealed before. Prior to this, he was upset that he would not be able to reveal him. Why was he so upset that he would not be able to reveal these things? He says, because this is my purpose in the world, is to reveal these teachings. I don't want to go into, into the world to come without having given over these ideas. But there's much more to it than that. There's a statement in the Zohar that says as follows. Betlat Kshirin Mikashron Dabado. Israel or Rise of Kuchabrihu, the Israelites, the Torah, and Hashem, Hakodesh Baruchu, are bound together with three knots. They're bound together with three knots. 
Kulhu, Satim Vagalya, all of them revealed and hidden, hidden and revealed. What is happening at this particular point in time is that Rabbi Shimon is revealing the very deepest parts of the Torah in order to be able to connect the deepest part of the soul, the most hidden recesses of the soul, to the most hidden aspects of the divinity, that which cannot be revealed, not in nature, and not even in the level which stands above nature, transcends nature, but is nevertheless in a way connected with it, but the very deepest of levels of godliness, which had never been revealed until that time. So Rabbi Shimon's purpose in doing what he's doing is in fact to connect the souls of the people that he's speaking to, to connect their souls to the, higher, to the highest dimensions of the esoteric teachings, the teachings of the Zohar, the teachings of Kabbalah, in order to connect them to the very highest levels of godliness. Now, that essentially is what Langba Omer is all about. If you have ever um, been to Miron, Miron is the place where Rabbi Shimon is buried. If you've ever been to Miron at this particular time, at the time of the day of his passing, so you have tens of thousands, actually, when I was there, when I lived in Israel, I'm sure it's even more now, they had 200, 250, 300,000 people coming to Miron, Mount Miron. It's a, it's a mountain, not a very big mountain, but a mountain. And all of them trying to get into the burial chamber, the cave where he is, uh, where Rabbi Shimon is buried. And it is a time of great joy. It's a time of singing. It's a time of tremendous happiness. It's a time of, uh, of intense, what is called dvekut. Dvekut meaning cleaving to the Almighty. It's cleaving to the inner dimensions of the Torah which were revealed on this day. So the whole day of Lagba Omer, therefore, is essentially an opportunity for people to be able to connect. What are they connecting to? Not only are they connecting to their essential selves through the Torah, but they're really connecting to a dimension which is completely beyond themselves. Now, let me explain it as follows. There are two ways of looking at a concept in Kabbalah. The, perhaps the most important concept in, in Kabbalah is called the concept of Yehudim. Let me just explain uh, what I mean by Yehudim. Historically, there were three eras of Kabbalistic revelation. The earliest stage of Kabbalistic revelation, and all of them are found in the Zohar, by the way, but the earliest stage of focus of Kabbalists until the time of um, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, so the whole focus was on understanding things developmentally. What is the, develop the development of the Sefirot, the development of the world, the development of uh, physicality from spirituality, of yesh mi'ayin, of something from nothing. How did it all come about? And what's the inner structure of the reality which we see around us, and what is its psychic history, so to speak? It's inner dimensional, spiritual, mystical history. So the whole focus, therefore, of the, um, of the generations that followed uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, from that time onwards, the primary examination was this sort of historical, it's called Seder Hishtoshalut, the process of development, the chaining down of the worlds from the highest to the lowest, from nothingness to somethingness, and that was the focus. After the time of the Ramak, and the Ramak sort of codified this into a, into a book called the Pardes Rimonim, the Pardes. After the time of the Ramak, there was a, uh, a very great teacher, really the father of modern Kabbalah, who is called Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. 
the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. Rabbi Yitzhak Luria had a whole different approach. Built on the previous approach, but now different in the sense that what he looked at was not historical development, historical spiritual development, but what he began to look at now was the interaction of elements of reality with each other. Those elements of reality are called, those elements of reality are called um, partsufim. A partsuf, or in uh, the translation that we call the visage, those, those partsufim are clusters of sfirot, or sfirot as they are in full iteration. In other words, sfirot within sfirot that form a relationship. These partsufim are called Abba, the father, in other words, Chochma, but Chochma as it comes into relationships. Ima or Bina, Bina as it comes into relationships. Zer Anpin, Malchut, these are some of the partsufim. Now, Larizal emphasized the connection between these partsufim and how the interaction affects each of them. So his primary teaching was how do we bring together partsufim and how do we get them to interact in a way that produces spiritual offspring, so to speak, spiritual children, so to speak, in a way that can affect us very positively, in a way that can affect us in such, it can affect the world to make it a better, a brighter, a lighter, um, uh, a more holy place. That was his, um, that was his approach. And that again was the approach that existed, was dominant until the time of the Baal Shem Tov. Along came the Baal Shem Tov, and when the Baal Shem Tov began his teachings, the Baal Shem Tov uh, lived in the 1700s, late 1600s, early 1700s. Uh, the Baal Shem Tov taught a whole new way of looking at things. What interested him primarily was what is called Hashra'a. So, the first era is called Hishtal Shalut, the chaining down of the worlds. The second era is called Hitlav Shut, the inter enclosing of various aspects. And the third era is called Hashra'a. Now, Hashra'a can mean two things. It can mean the, the, the indwelling of godliness in the world in a revealed way. It could also mean inspiration. Inspiration in the sense of divine inspiration. Now, the divine inspiration that we're talking about and uh, the dwelling of godliness upon things is basically two sides of the same coin. The Baal Shem Tov spoke about that, about the concept of divinity being revealed in the world and in a way that inspires and lifts up and lights up the world around. Now, the teachings that Rabbi Shimon revealed on the last day of his uh, living in this world essentially had to do with this whole concept that the Baal Shem Tov spoke about. It was not understood until much, much later, but this is what he spoke about. He spoke about how to make the bond between godliness and the soul as it is down here via the Torah, via the inner dimension of the Torah, the teachings of Kabbalah. And that's essentially what um, the day of Lagba Omer is about. So therefore, on Lagba Omer, if, um, you, if you've ever spent any um, time in Meron or uh, at local uh, celebrations of the event, you will find that they light a huge bonfire. What is the purpose of the bonfire that's lit on Lagba Omer? The purpose of the bonfire is to symbolize a number of different things. One of them is it symbolizes the passing of 
Rabbi Shimon, when we when 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 somebody passes away, it's customary to light what's called a yotzeit candle, a candle in commemoration of the person who passes away on the anniversary of his death. So the bonfire is a yotzeit candle, but it's more than a yotzeit candle. It is also a symbol of the fire that surrounded Rabbi Shimon when he started to give over these teachings. If you remember, at the beginning of the Idra Zuta, he forgot. Uh, the uh, the uh, the fire the 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 glow that was around him left him, and then it came back. That glow also rep is represented by the bonfire. Another idea of the bonfire is that it lights up even more than a candle. Obviously, it lights up all around it, and the idea is that a light for one person is a light for a hundred. Whoever can can gain from the light is welcome to take whatever they can from it. Furthermore, the idea of lighting a bonfire is that it shows the idea of something that Rabbi Shimon also spoke about on the last day of his, uh, of his, uh, of his existence, which was, he said like this, Bechad Ketira is Katanabe. I am bound to him with one knot, and then he goes on to say, like a flame to a coal. I'm bound to him like a flame to a coal. In other words, the flame and the coal are intimately related. But that's the way he goes on to say, and that's the way it was all throughout my life. I was bound to the Holy One, blessed be he to God, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I was bound like a flame to a coal. Uh, to a coal. And that flame also is represented by the lighting of the bonfire on Lag Baomer. Even more so, to go even a little bit deeper, the flame that's represented by the bonfire is essentially the flame of the soul. The soul itself is called a candle. Ner mitzvah the Torah or, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the commandments and the Torah are also called a flame. But Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, God's candle is man's soul. So when it comes to the day of Lagba Omer and we're lighting this, the, those, uh, those candles, what is it that we're trying to remember? What is the message? The message is this is a time, an auspicious time, when we can actually light up our souls and when we're able to um, glean a taste of what it means to be connected to the source, like Rabbi Shimon was connected to the source on, uh, on Lagba Omer. So, the day of Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer, which is the day that we're on now, is therefore uh, an opportunity to, it's an opportunity to connect. But it's not just an opportunity to connect in a, in a superficial way. It's an opportunity to connect in a way that goes much, much deeper than our consciousness. And I'm going to explain what I mean, uh, what I mean by that. Kabbalah explains that there's really five levels of a person's soul. The soul is not comprised of just um, physical consciousness. There are five different levels, which are called in, in Hebrew... Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, and Yechida. Now, what these are, I'll explain one by one. Nefesh, the level of Nefesh, the soul, as it's usually, there's five names for the soul, but each name represents a different aspect. The, the aspect of Nefesh, the aspect of Nefesh is the life force of the body and the awareness of the world around us through our senses. Now, we are commonly aware of five senses, um, the uh, sense of taste, the sense of touch, the sense of smell, hearing, seeing, etc. Kabbalah um, teaches that there are actually 12 senses, not just uh, it's the, the sense of movement, the sense of development, the sense of uh, right and wrong. There's all, uh, there's, there, there are 12 senses altogether. Um, I have a class on it if you want to go to the archive at kabbaladecoder.com. And um, you, can, you can have a look at it over there. 
in any event, the lowest level of consciousness is consciousness of the physical world through the senses. The sense of sleep is one of them also, by the way. So the, the, uh, the connection with the world. Then there's a deeper emotion, a deep, uh, sorry, a deeper level of consciousness. That deeper level of consciousness is called Ruach. Ruach, or spirit, which is the awareness of emotional qualities. All the emotions, they're primarily seven or even uh, perhaps six emotions. There's love and there's fear and there's compassion and so on and so forth. We have classes in this as well, um, available at the recordings. Those, that emotional awareness, the, awaren the awareness of our interconnection with other people through our emotions, are um, what is called the consciousness of Ruach. Then there's a much deeper level called the conscious, consciousness of Neshama, which is essentially intellectual consciousness. This goes together, in fact, with the Svirot. The lowest Svirot, the lowest dimension of, uh, of, of consciousness, is the Svira of Malchut, the lowest of the Svirot. The six um, emotional, seven emotional qualities are Ruach and correspond to the six Firot of Zer Anpin, Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzachod, Yosod. Those six Firot, the six divine emanations, which are called the six, uh, the six Sefirot. And then the level of Neshama corresponds to Bina. To bina meaning understanding. Now, bina understanding. There's a verse that says nishmas kel tavi name. Nishmas kel tavi name that the the the, the uh, that God gives the soul understanding. God gives the soul understanding. Now, understanding therefore has to do with that. Intellectual understanding has to do with that level of so-called neshama. There's an even deeper level called uh, chaya. And chaya is the awareness of one's total non-existence before God. In the presence of God, the non-existence of the ego, the complete non-existence of, of, of anything is called chaya. It corresponds to a level of Keter, which is called Arich Anpin, I spoke about before, will. But the very highest level of the soul, the very highest level of the soul, which is called Yechida, which essentially means oneness, that corresponds to the inner dimension of, uh, of Keter, which is called, as I mentioned before, Atik Yomin. So, what Rama Shimon revealed on that day is that we're all connected. We might not realize it, we might not know it. Everybody has these five levels of soul. Most people only live on the first and second dimension of the soul, the first and second level of soul, the physical awareness of our surroundings, and perhaps on a little bit of a deeper level of emotional awareness. Intellectual awareness, if people study and they think, and they, they may have that too. But then the higher levels, until the highest level of the soul, Yechida of the soul, Yechida Leyachdach as it's called, Yechida to unite with you, to unite with God, that is the level on which Rabbi Shimon was introducing these teachings, and that, what, uh, that is what was supposed to give us the understanding of, um, of the teachings of Rabbi Shimon on that particular day. Now, uh, we now have one of our other panelists with us, um, Rabbi Ami Chai, uh, who just uh, came in from Israel. Um, are you ready to, uh, you ready to go, Ami Chai? Yeah. I can uh, make you, um, I can make you the, let's see over here, how do I make you? I have to make you. Can everyone hear Amichai? Can you just write in the chat box if you can hear him speak? Amichai, speak a minute. Hi, everybody. Shalom. Welcome. Okay, good. So, go ahead. Yeah. 
All right. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome to Tzfat, first of all. We've got, literally, we've got Rashbi, we've got this amazing celebration right in, in, in back of me um, that's going on. Literally, we, you know, we hear the music and uh, this f constant uh, festivities. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible, um, amazing. And, uh, but I just wanted to, first of all, I wanted to thank Rabbi Moshe Miller uh, for, for, for putting this together, putting this amazing, um, you know, collection of people and, uh, and really celebrating this amazing, amazing day. So while, while you're doing that, Amichai, let me introduce you properly. Um, I have a little bio here for you and uh, you could add to it or subtract from it as you wish. But uh, Rabbi Amichai Cohen is a teacher and spiritual mentor in uh, Tzfat. He lives in Tzfat in Israel, which is across the mountain from Miron. He's a senior lecturer in Ascent of Tzfat, of Safed. If anyone's ever been there and they've been to Safed, he's one of the people that's a senior lecturer there. And he also runs uh, a website called LiveKabbalah.com, an online platform for the study of the inner dimensions of the Torah. Uh, Rabbi Amichai has spoken to thousands of students, including facilitating hundreds of birthright groups and topics about topics in Jewish thought, Jewish mysticism, contemporary subjects relating to transformative change. He holds a master's degree in special education, and he also owns a boutique winery called Earth and Air, situated in the foothills of Mount Meron. Now, it's very interesting that he owns a little winery, a boutique winery, because as we know, um, of all the liquids in the Torah, the one that represents the secrets of the Torah, the sword of the Torah is wine. Nichnas yayen yetzeh sod. When the wine comes in, the secrets go out. So it's very interesting that he has spent um, uh, time building up this boutique winery, and you might want to talk to him about that privately. Um, uh, by the way, anyone who is on the on the uh, who's uh, listening in now, I will um, be very happy to give you the emails of any of the participants, any of the uh, panelists, uh, if you request them, and um, of course that um, you can correspond with any of the panelists uh, that way. Uh, without further ado, uh, Rabbi Amichai, go ahead. Okay, so uh, so I'd like to uh, make a, a, a lechaim on coffee, if that's okay. It's a little too early for wine right now. Uh, so it's, four, uh, it's uh, quarter to 5 a.m. over here uh, in Israel, but it's uh, might as well, it's really just day, daytime. Uh, so lechaim to that. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to share a story. Back in the 1800s, one of the students of, of the Ruzhner, of the famous uh, Rebbe, Rabbi Israel of Ruzhin, uh, made the long uh, journey to Eretz Yisrael, made the long journey to Israel. And uh, in those days, obviously, it wasn't so simple to get to Israel. But he made the journey specifically to come to the celebration of Lagba Omer. And it surely took a number of weeks. And on his way back to Rajin, he, of course, stopped by his Rebbe, Rabbi Israel of Rajin. And the Ruzhner, as he's termed, uh, was, ex was excited to meet somebody that was by Meron on Lagba Omer. And he took him into his personal study and he asked him, what did you see in Meron? What was it that you experienced on that day? So he said, Rebbe, I can't really explain to you what I saw, but I'll try to describe um, how, what, thing, what happened. And he said, well, when I got close to the mountain, I saw, you know, all types of, uh, all types of people um, that, that were there. And some people were, sort of connected to the, the festivities, some were not, some were onlookers, you know, wondering what was going on. And as I reached higher on the mountain, I saw uh, people that were dancing in, in, a, in almost a, a sense of, of, of revelry. Um, and then as I got deeper in, I saw people that were in midst of, of prayer. As I got deep, as I got more into this this circle of of, of Rabbi Shimon of the of the Rashbi, as I got closer to the 
actual shrine, the area of Rashbi, people were praying. And then when I got the, really to Rashbi himself, there was silence there. And right there in the middle, there was absolute silence. And everybody that was standing there was in a state of, of high ecstasy, so to speak, meditation. Um, and there was absolute silence around that area. So he said, Rebbe, that's what I saw. That's what I could explain to you that I saw. I, you know, that's, that's what it was. And, you know, now you make sense of it. And the Ruzhner said, absolutely. That makes complete sense to me because that's the whole idea of Rashbi, that the whole aspect of Rashbi is this um, connection and fusion of opposites. It's not just the connection of the um, those holy people that are amidst right the shrine of the Rashbi, but just the opposite. It's the it's the people that are outside. It's that that whole celebration which is going on, which is the real light of the Rashbi. So, really, to understand this day is you know takes a lot of uh, uh, a lot of contemplation because this day is not such a simple day. It's a day that draws five hundred thousand people to this particular small area in it, called Meron. It's a small town. And uh, people make it, you know, months. They, some people, some people really just bunk out for a month before. Um, the roads are absolutely packed uh, with people. And and why do people make it there? I mean, what what is really the attraction over here about the Rashbi? They never. Most of the people never even really opened up the Zohar. They didn't really learn. They didn't really contemplate. And but they're still celebrating. It's like that student. Uh, described to the Ruzhner, he said, you know, those people were dancing outside. Some people were, you know, they, they weren't a part of the inner, sort of speak, festivity. Why were they there? What's the idea? What's the inner meaning of Rashbi? So to really understand the aspect of Rashbi takes, uh, takes as, I, as I mentioned, a little bit of, of, of really contemplation, maybe a lot. And really the story of Rashbi really takes us back to the creation of the world. Back to the story of Genesis. And in the story of Genesis, uh, we start off um, the, whole, the whole creation of the world, right? At the beginning, God created the world and he created light. And the word for light is or. God created light. And actually, it's interesting that the 25th word in the Torah is light, which is very significant because also it relates to Another holiday that relates to light, which is, which is Hanukkah. And that's the first time that we see the word lights, the 25th, relating to the 25th day of Kislev. But then on the 33rd word, if we, uh, if we take a look, on the 33rd word, it says the word tov. It says the word tov. Tov means good in Hebrew. And that's when the light is distinguished between being a light and now it's being a good light, specifically on the 33rd day. And the Kabbalists say that this is an allusion to this day of Lag Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, which is a good day, a Yom Tov. It's not an official Yom Tov, but it is a, a day of, 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 of goodness. And it's a day that, that goodness was revealed to the world. The ultimate tov and the ultimate uh, really uh, expression of light comes into the world uh, on this day. And the famed uh, commentator called uh, Rash, uh, uh, Rashi uh, explains what does that mean uh, that God saw the light that it was good. He said that God saw that, that light and darkness cannot really serve uh, exclusively, they can't serve together, and they had that, and and the light had to have been uh, really put aside, and the and put away, as Rashi says, quoting quoting the midrash, uh, and this light was was stored away for the tzaddikim, for the righteous ones in the day to, in the days to come, for the future. 
So this light of, of Tov was this light that was stored away. Why? Because light could be used, could be misused. And unless we really hide this light, this light may be um, used in the wrong way by the wrong people. So now let's try to understand a little bit more about what went on with this light. And as we really con as we continue on with the story in Genesis, uh, we go to the story of Adam and Eve. And over there, the story of Adam and Eve, we, by the tree of what we call the tree of knowledge, we see um, the story of good and bad, where Eve is told not to touch, right, and not to eat the, really not to touch the tree. And the snake comes along and he says that, why not touch the tree? And why not eat the tree? Eat from the fruit of the tree. Why? Because we know that unless you, if, why shouldn't you eat from the, from the fruit? Because if you would know, if you would eat from that fruit, you would know the difference between good and bad. Yedu tov vera. So the Kabbalists explain that the whole descent of the world really came about as a result of this, um, of this primordial mistake, right, that was made by Adam and Eve of really misusing this uh, tree of what we call the tree of knowledge, which is called the Eitz Atov Vera, the good and bad. So essentially, good and bad became mixed together. And that is the loss, as termed by the Kabbalists, the loss of das, the loss of consciousness, of godly consciousness. Now, this story of the loss of consciousness is really the story of our lives. It's really the story of why we're in this world. We're in this world to really regain our consciousness, really regain, regain the, uh, the connection that we have that with, uh, with dat. Right, and to know good in the ultimate sense of the word. So after the sin of knowledge, right, we know that Adam took from the fig tree, and from then on, the world had to, what we call, had to have been fixed. Letaken. The world was in a state of, of, of destruction, in a sense, and now Adam was, um, was really given the mission to now fix the mistake that he made. So this whole process of fixing now takes us to another stage. And I'm kind of going a little bit quick on, on some of these stages because the truth is we could discuss these, uh, each one of these in, in, in great, great detail. Um, so we go to uh, Jacob, the, the story of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, according to the Kabbalists, is really an, an extension of Adam, and he's really the fixing of Adam. And in fact, they say that he had the same shufre. The Zohar says that the face of Jacob is the face of, of Adam, and they had the same exact face. And Esau represents, back, represents the primordial uh, snake, represents the negativity once again. And that battle of Jacob and Esau is once again the battle of Adam in the state of, in, in, back in the uh, Garden of Eden. But this time things are different. Ad, Adam, in this case, or Jacob, really wins over, right, and beats that primordial snake, beats uh, Esau. But Esau sees that he cannot beat him and what happens is that he grabs his sciatic nerve and he grabs that nerve which is called um which is called the gidanasha and with that he causes jacob to limp now that gidanasha and that sciatic nerve represents the element or the sphera of what we call hod now there's let me just explain that is the idea of godly consciousness. Godly consciousness is, in, is an intellectual faculty. From the intellectual faculty, right, is, it's not enough for a person to just have the intellectual faculty. A person could be, can be, be intellectual, but not practical. The 
revelation of of that knowledge of that of that consciousness comes about through uh, the proactivity of that sphera of that emanation that we call hod. Now, Esau, Esav knew that, and he knew that in order to stop this uh, this this fixing of of Jacob, he had to touch, as is as the uh, as the verses tell us, his his leg and specifically the leg of hod now we learn that the word for hod is also if we take the letters it's also the letters dava dava means to lament and the kabbalists teach us that asav really did a uh, really caused the destruction the eventual destruction uh, of the temple by touching that element of hod that element of hod eventually caused the destruction of the both both temples and even more specifically the sciatic nerve uh we're taught is uh, represents the day of the ninth of of we know that we have 365 sinews and each one of them represents another day on the on the calendar and the day of the the day that represents that is represented by the sciatic nerve is the day of Tisha B'av. So the, the, that destruction really came about as um, as a result of that battle of Jacob and Esau, and that really means that the fixing of that has to come about through the through the midah through the sphere of Hod, through this aspect of Hod, which we didn't really discuss what it is yet. But just to take this further um, in, in, our, um, in our history, uh, Moses once again stands up on the mountain and we're taught that, he sta- that his mission is to bring about the Torah and to draw down the Torah and to really fix that primordial sin. And Moses is w- once again a, a reincarnation of some sort of adam and his purpose is to really uh is to really bring about a the perfection of the world once again but we know things turned out a little bit differently and the whole sin of the of the golden calf came about and moses wasn't able to pull down right the torah as well as he wanted wanted to Right there was there was an issue over there with pulling down the Torah, and that has to do with the aspect of hod of revealing it and proactively revealing it. So, um, so the the Torah became bashed, right, and became destroyed in a certain way. And once again, uh, we're in that state of imperfection, waiting for perfection. So, fast forward um, a number of thousand thousand uh, years and we really jump to uh, Roman rule and Roman rule really the Romans were in town for quite a while in Israel they were in you know for a number of centuries their event their ultimate mission is to really create a Judea capita as they minted on their coins they wanted to take the uh, the Jewish people right and they wanted to completely um, it, it incarcerate them in, in every aspect of the way, right? To really uh, expunge them from, uh, from having any connection to, uh, to Judaism, to spirituality. But the word that is used is Judea. And it's not, it, was, it wasn't Philistine, and it was before that, it was called Judea. And that, that's historically because the Jewish people, or the majority of the Jewish people, are from the from the um, tribe of Judah. But Judah re- comes from the word Yehuda in Hebrew. Comes from the word Hod, and the reason for that is that really the deepest aspect of of being Jewish, and and really the the depth of that is the is the connection that. Uh, that we have with the sphera of a hod, 
as as it says in in in, in Megillah, it says, what is the idea of being who's called uh, Yehudi, who's called Jewish? Not not necessarily someone who is uh, from the tribe of Judah. It means that somebody that has this uh, this under this higher awareness of godliness and 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 this um, antithesis, this this uh, this hatred almost of something which stands in the way of of that revelation of godliness in the world. That is someone who's called a Yehudi. So the Romans were, the mission of the Romans was essentially to really control the entire land of Israel and to remove this Yehuda, to remove this aspect of Hod from, uh, from, from within us. And here comes Rashbi onto the scene. So we have to historically understand what was going on at that time. Besides uh, the Romans being in town, they were in town for, for quite a while. This is after the destruction of the temple. After the destruction of the temple, the Jewish people go into a state of uh, a double destruction, really. Because now there's not just the destruction of the temple, but now there's almost the destruction of the Torah. Right? The Romans go after the Torah. They go after... Uh, the, the 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 teachings of the Torah because they know they know that that is the only way that they are really going to uh, control and they really o- they could really overcome uh, this power of the Jewish people. So here the Rashbi Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai comes on the scene, and Rashbi is pretty much not willing to to do that, and he is um, not willing to go into really just giving up on his learning, giving up on his teaching, and he has to go into hiding. And he goes into hiding, right? The, the Talmud tells us he goes into, into hiding first for 12 years, and then he goes back. There was a 13th year that he had to go back into the cave, and that time um, represents the going back into the state of paradise. The Zohar says that that Rashbi, by going into the cave, he really went into a state of solitude. He really went into the state of, of, of really, like we say, making Seder, making order in the creation. And by digging into the ground, right, that's what Rashbi and his son did. They actually dug into the ground. They didn't study Torah above ground. They, they dug within the ground. That means that, that they pulled down the revelation into the world. They pulled down the revelation. They were, they were immersed in the world. Their bodies were, were immerse, immersed in the world. And for those uh, 13 years, they're all Rashbi ate, Rashbi and his son Rabbi Elazar ate. All they ate were, um, there was a boxer tree that grew outside. And overnight it grew outside. And the word for, bu- and, and, uh, and there was a stream of water that also, um, there was a miracle that it was revealed. But the word for buxer in Hebrew is charuv. Charuv means, in Hebrew, also means destructive, destruction. And the Rashbi, for those 13 years, ate the buxer tree, ate the charuv. It happens to be that the buxer tree, the charuv tree, is actually ex- extremely healthy for a person. On a, on a physiological level, it's, it's full of calcium and and some protein as well. So somebody could really sustain themselves on that on a physical level. But of course, there are, the symbolism of the Haruf tree is, goes way beyond the physical level. And it actually represents the idea of the destruction of the land of Israel, of the temple of the, time, uh, the temple that was destroyed at the time, as well as the destruction really of that, you know, the tree of, of good and bad, and really the, the story of, of this world the imperfected world, the world that is yet, not yet fixed. So the Zohar actually tells us that on the Sabbath, on, on Shabbat, the, the, um, the buxer tree turned into a fig tree. Miraculously, that buxer tree, the haruv tree, turned into a fig tree. And the Zohar alludes to that primordial tree of good and bad that was actually the fig tree. We, learned, we know that the tree of good and bad was actually the fig tree. Why? Because he, Adam covered himself 
with the leaf of the fruit that he ate. So that fruit is the, and, and it says specifically, what was, the, what was the fruit that he covered himself with? It was the te'ena. It was the fig tree. So for 13 years, on every, every Sabbath, every Shabbat, that, that carob tree turned into a fig tree. And Rashbi was elevated on the Sabbath to the level of perfection, to the level of, of, of the fixing of the world. Now, it's not for any reason, that, for no reason, that Rabbi Shimon is also re- referred to as the Sabbath. He's referred to as the expression of Shabbat, of the Sabbath. In other words, his whole essence is really the essence of the Sabbath and the, and, and the inner dynamic, the inner aspect of, Sab- of the Sabbath is the idea of the unity and the perfection of everything that's within the world and that there is no destruction on the Sabbath, and one is not allowed to even consider that there's destruction on, on, on the Sabbath. Whatever, whatever went on during the week does not apply on the Sabbath. And the whole inner aspect of Rabbi Shimon is the, is the idea of the Sabbath. And the Kabbalists teach us that the idea of the 13 years that, that Rashbi was in the cave, he was in the cave to really bring this level of Echad, 13 in numerology, is 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 echad is one and rashbi's whole essence is to bring about this this unification and revelation of the unity of godliness within the world and after doing that rashbi was able to walk out of the cave go out of the cave and go into the world so now we're in a uh, a state right now in time which is called the omer the, the counting of the omer and today's the 33rd day of the omer and something about uh this day really shifts the entire uh the entire perspective of the sphere to omer the sphere to omer is traditionally more more of a negative type of a day and why is it more of a negative type of a day because the students of rabbi akiva died during this period of time from, from uh, the, the, the second day of, of Passover until basically until the 33rd day of the Omer. They continuously died. 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva passed away. Now, we're taught that this metamorphosis of the Sphere to Omer is really not just the is not just the the counting of the sphere to Omer is not just a time the time that we're in, but it's actually it's it's a microcosm of our whole life journey where our life journey is really about counting. It's about making our days count. It's about transforming our days. So we have this time during the year that we transform, but we also have that uh, vaster amount of time, right of the creation of the world, where we are also counting time and we're also fixing and, and, and metamorphosizing. So this revelation of the 33rd day, to, day of the Omer is not, just a, 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 is not just the 33rd day that's within this year specifically, but it represents a, a, a juncture in time. And this juncture in time is really the juncture of transformation that we refer to as becoming um, man, becoming Adam, and really transforming our, our dat, transforming our, our awareness, our consciousness from being animalistically inclined to being godly inclined. So how do we do that? How do we infuse ourselves? How do we become infused with dat, with this revelation? Because that's, that's what the whole world is about, and that's what our inner fixings, each and every one of us, in each and every one of our real um, life mission. And, and, and if, if we would solve this, if we would have this, then it, most of our uh, issues, all of our issues are, will go away. And we, we could live a, a perfected life and we could live uh, the, the ultimate happiest life in the world and bring about the ultimate highest revelation in the world if we would just have what we call that if we would have this idea of consciousness, this idea of merging with 
with the higher uh, awareness of the creation of the world and high, higher, higher awareness of our inner role within that creation. But in order to do that, we have to perfect what we refer to as the animal self. So to reach a, the perfection of Das, it's not enough just for, for a person to be intellectually involved in it, but they have to be experientially involved in it as well. And that means taking the dot and infusing it into Hod, or having the awareness of Hod, which draws down the dot. And that is why on this day, the day of Lagba Omer, the day of Lagba Omer is the day of Hod. It's really the, the perfection of Hod. It's Hod Sheba Hod. It's, the, it's that, uh, uh, that um, acknowledgement within acknowledgement. It's that drawing down of acknowledgement, which really uh, changes the whole, th this whole, uh, you know, um, time frame of the sphere at Omer, where we really reach a, a new plateau. And that's why uh, our, um, uh, our Kabbalists actually bring out that the 49 days of the Omer start off with, the, with really the 32 days, and then we have 17 days. So the first 32 days is the idea of Lev, and then we have the next 17 days are, is, are the days of what we call Tov. In numerology, Tov is 17. And from, from now on, from the 33rd day on, we have this, this shift of taking the, the heart, the revelation of the, of, of the heart, the revelation of what is, could be intellectually known, and shifting it into experiential good. And all of this experiential good is all a, a, a precursor, it's all a, a preparation to the receiving of the Torah. It's all a, a, a really a, an introduction to receiving of the Torah. And it's interesting that the introduction to receiving of the Torah comes on Lagba Omer. So we first really take, about, take, take with, within us this connection of inner Torah, the connection of Rashbi, of, of Lagba Omer, and only after that we're able to go into the receiving of the, what we refer to as the revealed aspect of Torah. And that aspect of Torah is when we become Adam. We become what we call as man, Adam. And Adam refers to one who is uh, metamorphosized, one who is fixed, whereas that process of the Omer is the process of the animal, the process of the, really of the uh, changing of, of, of the animal and infusing consciousness into it, into the animal consciousness, into the animal soul, until one can come to this to the state of being Adam, being being man. And being Adam takes us back to the tree of knowledge of good, of good and bad, takes us back to being Adam back back in the in the primordial sense, back to the to the uh, Garden of Eden of of Adam and Eve, and refixing right that mistake of Adam and Eve. So in the very famous uh, song of Rashbi, written by Rabbi Shimon Lavi, also a very famous Kabbalist and very famous song of Bar Yochai. We all probably have heard it, right? It's called Bar Yochai Nimshachta Asherecha, right? That very amazing song. Rabbi Shimon Lavi says over there that Nase Adam Nemar Bavurecha, that man was, was it, when it was man, when we say about man, it was said about you, about Rashbi, about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. If you, if you wait one second, I'll actually play that song. One second. Here we go.
Yeah. That, that, that song is, is one of the deepest songs really uh, out there. Uh, the Baba Sali, the famous uh, sage, the Baba Sali said that if I had a whole year, I wouldn't be able to explain to you not even one verse uh, on, on the, on the Bar Yochai, uh, on the Bar Yochai song. So each one of them actually refers to another sphera because Rashbi really perfected all of the sphera and it starts from the Malchut and it goes all the way back up to Keter, to Keter, which refers to crown. And this is the whole metamorphosis of the, of the sphera Ta'omer is, is coming from the animal and to become man. But, then, but we have this, this day of Lagba Omer, we have this, this incredible gift of the 33rd uh, day of the Omer and the incredible gift of the light of the Rashbi that really came about us and, uh, and uh, really um, revealed to us this, this amazing light, that the light is good. Ta'or kitov. And that's why in the Zohar, the Zohar constantly says, to us, the, the Zohar actually calls the Torah oraita, calls the Torah the light, because we could actually see that light through the teachings of the Rashbi. And Tachazi, Tachazi is seeing the light is through the, uh, the, the Torah of, of, of Rashbi. So I just want to wrap up and, uh, and go back to that original story that, uh, that I started off with. Uh, with that student of the of the Ruzhna, of Rizal of Rizhin, what he saw over there in Meron. And what he saw over there in Meron, again, he couldn't explain what he saw. He thought he saw that that revelation of the of the of the simple people, and he saw that revelation of of the people that are that are dancing, and then the, the, the revelation of the people that were in a state of ecstasy on the highest level. And and he, he said to his Rabbi, I don't, I don't understand what, what I saw. He said, that's the, the whole idea of Rashbi is the revelation of the lowest most aspect. The highest most light has to become revealed in the lowest most aspect. And therefore, the day of the Rashbi is not just for scholars. It's not just for those who understand the secrets of the Torah. But the, that light has to become revealed in the lowest, most aspect, in the element of hope, in the element of really of acknowledgement that that light has to become revealed all the way down because that's the whole perfection. That's the whole perfection of the world is really about the, that, that revelation of consciousness within existence, within this world. So practically what we could perhaps take away from this is that, you know, we we all we all need to um we all need to to have this this light within our lives and we all want this light within our lives but that light within that light of hod that light of rashbi how do we take that light of rashbi that light of rashbi is really a light of selflessness and when we take that light of selflessness we take that light of really going beyond our our mind beyond our our restrictions and what, what we could do and, uh, and going beyond ourselves and connecting with what is outside of us, with the others, right? Then we bring about this, uh, this, this revelation of, of Rashbi into this world. But even more so, it's not enough just to be connected to Rashbi one time a year, but it's extremely important to take that light of Rashbi in the form of the learning of, of the inner aspect of Torah, of the light of Torah. And when we take that, that, that learning of Torah, that light of Torah, which, uh, which could be achieved by the studying of the Zohar, by the studying of the teachings of, of the Baal Shem Tov, the teachings of Hasidut, right? When we take that within us, so we take that consciousness, that, that godly consciousness, and we bring it into our lives, and we bring it into our day-to-day -day lives. And with that, we bring Rashbi into this world. And that's the, really the only antidote to this world is really this, um, is this light of the Rashbi. It's the only, it's the only, uh, it's, it's the only light, it's the only uh, really uh, fixing uh, that, that we have in this world. And it's the only um, uh, hope that we have in this world is, is the light of, of, of the Pnimi Tatara. It's not necessarily the guns that we have and the, 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 the wars that we're fighting, we see or politicians trying to, to, to bring about 
resolving conflicts. The only resolving of conflicts that we could really have is really the light of Pnimyuta Torah, the light of the inner Torah. So I want to bless everybody over here from, literally from seeing the Rashbi over here, that all of us should be blessed in, in everything that we need in physicality and spirituality, and we should ultimately be successful in bringing about this, uh, this revelation of Hod within our lives on a personal level and on a collective level. So a good Yom, yom Tov to everybody. Thank you very much, Rabbi Ami. Uh, Rami Chai, we really appreciate it. Um, you're jumping on. It's the middle of the night. Uh, he was up almost uh, the entire night and uh, just um, came from Miron. We really appreciate your participation. And um, the next speaker is Rabbi Eli Silberstein. If you just hold on one minute, I will... Uh